everybody. I am very excited because today I am going to be joined by none other than the Neo Guru, uh, David Meza, who has been using Neo at NASA for very many years. And I've also known him for quite some time. And I have to say that he is truly inspirational. He's really great at his craft. And he's one of the most humble, nicest guys to talk to. And I had an absolute blast talking to him today about not only his machine learning practices and how you can add ethics into that, but also his experiences with Neo. And I hope that you get some inspiration to go and try out some Neo Forger after this as well. So with that, let's go check it out. Well, first off, Ashley, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, for your viewers, I'm uh, David Mesa. I'm currently the uh, acting branch manager for the people analytics team at the human capital office within NASA headquarters. Um, basically what that means is I'm overlooking the uh, AI ML architecture uh, for human capital, looking at how we basically turn data into some type of actionable knowledge through our machine learning algorithms and methodologies and looking at how we modernize our human capital infrastructure. Yeah, and I, I love that you use the word modernize because it doesn't necessarily mean, I think a lot of people when they get into the work that you're doing, machine learning, it's all new. I mean, it is, the, the, the methods are new, but what you're trying to achieve, it's the same stuff you've been trying to achieve for a while. <laughs> right, it, it's, it's all the same, yeah, it's, it's answers we've been trying to get. Uh, it's just now with the technology, we can hopefully get better answers. Mm -hmm. uh, if we do it right, we can get them a little faster. Uh, and, and we're able to at least re repeat and reproduce these things on a timely manner. Yeah, no, I, I think that is something that all of us could use. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I, I think a lot of people, they, they also think that machine learning, magic wand, ding, right? <laughs> um, watching WandaVision right now, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's it's just automating. It's using a different tool set than we had available to us before, a cool factor, but it's, also making sure that you you do have that confidence, right? Because you, you're not going off of people's gut instinct any longer. You can really be very data oriented when you have machine learning at your back, right? True, uh, very true. I mean, it's it, too many times I do, I do feel that people use the term uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, or even down deeper NLP and, and things like that, that uh, looking at it as a magic wand, as you say, mm -hmm. that they throw these terms out and eventually something will pop up. Um, but there is a methodology and a madness to what we're trying to do. Yeah. Uh, and we have to do it correctly, not only so that we can do it a lot faster and, and get the answers that we want, but we do it uh, both ethically, mm -hmm. morally, uh, mm -hmm. especially as we're dealing in, in, in the domain that I'm currently in, people analytics, we're dealing with a lot of people's information and, yeah. and how that works. We've got to think about this in the right way so that we can kind of imprint some kind of ethical methods into our algorithm so that we get the right results back. Yeah, that that's something that I'm also very passionate about, um, especially when you look at uh, the magic wand approach. It means you're just going to shove as much into something to just get that magical output and not really think of the implications of what you're doing. And also you might not. I, I actually had somebody tell me recently um, you know, they were very excited to start in uh, a new machine learning uh, com committee at their institution because they said, well, you know, machines, they're completely unbiased, so it's going to be great. And I thought, OK, let's have a conversation. <laughs> definitely. definitely. Right? Um, the machines are, can be unbiased, I guess. Uh, but since it's humans that are programming yep, the information yep, yep. into these machines, they're programming their biases into these machines very yeah, easily. Exactly. Um, there's actually, you know, if I could mention a, a good book I just read, mentioned mm -hmm. or read recently was The Ethical Algorithm. Mm -hmm. Very exciting about the new concepts they're doing within how they, they develop, mm -hmm. uh, put their ethical standards within the algorithm uh, to try to derive the right information. I think we just need more of that. People that are thinking about this, that it's not uh, it's not a game. Playing and experimenting is one thing, but at one point you do have to stop and think, okay, but you know, what are the ramifications of what this is? And if you want to put it into production, is it going to um, make sure that you're not 
hurting anybody. So how do you, you know what's going to happen from a global standpoint as far as your, your organization from a holistic or, or systems thinking standpoint? Mm -hmm. How does that impact? But also, can you effectively explain and interpret the information? Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. easy at times to interpret mathematically what the, the, the algorithms are telling you. But can you really explain why and how it's doing that, uh, which a lot of times gives us a lot of problems if we can't. When we start diving into how does your your methodology, how is it derived, where are you getting your features from, how are you developing mm -hmm. those, and where you, you're getting your data from. And when they start talking black box, you mm -hmm. know, I've automatically red flags start coming up because we really have to understand what we're doing here. Yeah, and it, that that takes me back a few years when everybody was you know, all excited about Watson. Everybody was talking about Watson. And I remember early in my career, I had the opportunity of working with Watson. And um, what we found out uh, was it was a, a black box to make any kind of corrections. Um, we, we built out the model and we worked with the engineers to build everything out. Um, so we had a lot to say there, but then after that, we weren't allowed to do anything. We had to basically work through that engineer and really understand what was going on. Um, and so it, it was just so difficult to really understand what was going on, uh, which deteriorated the trust and therefore, you know, we broke, we broke up, <laughs> so to speak with them. And I think that, you know, as you see how Watson kind of progressed in, in its in its trajectory, it 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 did kind of start to fall apart a little bit because of that. It was doing some things that maybe were a little questionable, but because it was mostly black box, how was anyone supposed to help fix it? True, true, because what you know, and we did so also some work with Watson and looking looking mm -hmm. at how that we might be able to use that capability. And I agree, since, since you're really looking with Watson more of a computational solution mm -hmm. where it's just looking at a probabilistic answer. You know, th this yeah. this is the highest probability this answer meets your question. Mm -hmm. Well, OK, maybe the highest probability, but it's only at 15 percent correct. Yeah. Yeah, you, you get you get that answer, but you don't really know how well it, it should be your answer. And it, and again, it all comes back to you know garbage in, garbage out. Yep. You don't have the right type of data going into it, and, and the right understanding of how you're managing that data, it makes it difficult to get the right answers. Yeah, and I love that you you also pointed out you know garbage in, garbage out. Yes, and also the, the data sources. I think a lot of people that I've talked to recently, um, you know, they've been using a lot of the external data sources that are free and open for everyone to use. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But um, I think that people often just stop after that. Hey, I use Wikidata, I'm good. First of all, I always point out to people that are using Wikidata for anything. Wikidata is built off of um, the human psyche of all of us, including the good and the bad. Right. So you can't just take all of it as fact, right? So that cautionary tale, always look at your data set before you just run with it. You're right. We Too many times we end up uh, just feeding from so many different sources without really looking at it and, and putting a little grain of salt. And as you know, you know, we've, seen, we've had this environment for a while now that we, we've really got to look at all, any kind of information we get and put a little bit of critical thinking and a little bit of analysis on there and just really say, is that right? <laughs> yeah, and you know, I, I want to bring it back to some of the work that you're doing because you are all over the internet talking about Neo4j. So <laughs> can you just share a little bit of your experience with Neo4j so far? So Neo, for me, it, it's been a long journey with the, with the product. So uh, in the sense that I started looking at this ooh, about 10 years ago now, uh, when it was still only command line interface, I think when mm -hmm. graph databases were basically just kicking off. Um, wow. So you were there from the beginning. That's amazing. I didn't know you had been working with them that long. That's pretty cool. I had started off and I realized right right then, you know, it, it wasn't ready for prime time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's more like, okay, let's see where this goes. But it, it started to show, you know, to me, it was it was a concept that was ready to take off graph databases in general, mm -hmm. and it was something that I thought the organizations needed. And it primarily goes back to to my history and, and my way of thinking, um, which you know may be a little scary to some folks, but uh, <laughs> it, it's it's development in, in growing up in the IT world. You know, as a computer scientist growing up and you know, being in computer um, or IT groups for the last thirty years. 
Uh, I did a lot of work in different types of IT functions. And then it really got to the point, okay, why are we doing these things? And decision analysis and figuring things out became a real passion for me and looking at, at how we do things. Um, and really started working a lot with decision trees and then mm -hmm. mind maps and, and, and basically because that's how my mind worked. Mm -hmm. and, and it works like that for a lot of people, especially a lot of technical people and a lot of mm -hmm. people in, in around NASA. We have a lot of highly technical people and they get that type of a vision. So that's mm -hmm. why graphs work. But I also kind of grew up in a SQL um, mentality. Yeah. I was a SQL developer for many years. So I understood you know, normalization and different tables and, mm -hmm. and, and all that. So seeing the label property graph, it, it was an easier connection for me to the to regular, um, you know, relational databases than going to an RDF. Mm -hmm. So that's why I made the decision between the two, even though about 10 years, it's around the same time joined a knowledge management organization yeah. to try to modernize their IT there and had a lot of conversations with the taxonomists and about RDF, triple stores, categorization, yeah. classification, yeah. things like that. Uh, but it still made more sense to me for from a perspective of looking at graph database for the label property graph. So mm -hmm. that being I started working with it. I started looking at different issues and got in contact with the company. And, and fortunately, you know, because I do have the, the backing of NASA behind me, they were very <laughs> interested to talk. Uh, That's nice. It doesn't, doesn't hurt to have NASA on your side. <laughs> <laughs> These are my opinions. I do want to point this out. This is not a, a NASA um, uh, endorsement of any type. This, this is just is what I use. It's not an endorsed video. It's not um, <laughs> anything that's sponsored. It's just me and David have a good conversation about data. Right. And, and, and in this case, I tried many different graph databases, and it was just that at that time, Neo was the one that was moving the further the fastest, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they were progressing. And I had an issue. I had something that popped up um, with an engineer, and, and, and if you anybody's seen some of the presentations I give, it, but this is the genesis of, of what got me to Neo4j, was mm -hmm. the fact that I had an engineer coming to talk to me, and I said, I need to find lessons learned in our lessons learned database, and I have these 23 keywords that I need to search for. But we were using a, a you know, fairly known search appliance in, in our in our enterprise at that time, and we were indexing too many things, and the individual mm -hmm. could not get specific information on those keywords for mm -hmm. those lessons learned. So I went to IT and I said, can you just index the lessons learned database and let's apply these keywords? Yeah, mm -hmm. we can take care of that. And two days later, they sent back a spreadsheet, 23 tabs, one for each keyword, and each of those oh, tabs yeah. had oh, no. various lessons. And I'm going, okay, I think <laughs> we can do better than this. Yeah. So it, that kind of started my thinking about how do I use graphs and how do I use graph database. And, and again, Neo at that time was probably on, you know, close to version two at that time, mm -hmm. maybe. And it was something that it was easier to use and ingest. And I was able to quickly take that lessons learned database. And since it was already in a semi-structured format in a, in a, in a CSV file, mm -hmm. I could ingest that very easily into um, Neo4j with some simple coding with, with using their cipher uh, language. So now I've got this case with this graph model of this lessons learned in there. But at the same time, I could connect to it very easily uh, with uh, R or, and or Python. So I was mm -hmm. able to pull that some, some of that information out run some topic modeling on the lessons and use that as more metadata that I can just back into the graph oh, database. Nice. Okay. Yeah, so, so now I've got all of these things working together and, and I've added this additional topic model. So now I've got my lessons connected to a topic. Yeah. So rather than finding a keyword, I can find an individual topic. In this case, he was looking for something like uh, water tanks and, and uh, uh, fuel valves and water valves. Mm -hmm. So there's a topic just for that. And I, he had a bunch of lessons he could easily go to. And, and we we applied some different types of uh, analytics to that, but it led me to develop the knowledge, knowledge architecture framework that I, that I worked with at Johnson Space Center, where we've got a combination of knowledge management, informatics, and data science to help us through all of that. And, and yeah. Neil was the the at that point was just the uh, the storage the facility. Of what we're trying to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think I I like that example too because I think t very often I hear. Uh, you know, the customer 360s and um, some of those transactional kind of use cases. There's a ton of those out there. There's a lot of people that are using things for, um, you know, risk assessment. 
there's I know there are a lot out there, but it's not as widely discussed. I think some of the the use cases you're talking about where it's that that topic modeling and being able to make uh, search effective. I have also worked with many engineers and I know it's precision, precision, precision. Give me the one thing that I need and I'm going to be happy. And it's a little different than, you know, the, the Google like search where it's like, give me everything. I'll look at only the first page, but give me everything. Right. And, you know, the knowledge graphs can accommodate both of those things. But I, I love that you saw this this problem and you started to think through it's it's a relation problem like you had these you know 20 tabs why why are there 20 tabs why why right. can't we you know model this in a different way and make it serviceable a different way so you've you've been using neo for quite some time now so are there any you know what are the big lessons learned that you you've had along the journey uh with neo so i think part of it was the, the the ability to quickly model or, or do a data model of your, your information or whatever you're trying to look at. Mm -hmm. And it's a learning curve for anybody. It's a learning curve for how you have to create that model in a graph format, whether you're doing it again in RDF or, or label property, you still got to think about that. Um, and what is, what is it yeah. you're gonna, is going to be a node and what is it that's going to be a relationship and yep. how do you, and in this case, what properties you assign to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so those things have been evolving over, over the last several years, um, primarily because again, graph networks were fairly new or graph databases mm -hmm. were fr fairly new. Mm -hmm. And as they started optimizing their internals, mm -hmm. it makes, gives you a better understanding of how you have to develop that model. So that's that's yeah. one of the keys there. Um, you know, the, the other things that started evolving in, inside of Neo4j were, or in particular was incorporating more um, role, or more enterprise type ready functionality such mm -hmm. as internal data data analytics. Mm -hmm. you know, early on, I had to pull the data out, run my analytics, oh, no. come up yeah. with my answers and then put, put that back into the database uh, in, in some way, whether it's a property, as a node or, or as a relationship. Um, over the last several years, they've, they've developed a data science group within Neo4j mm -hmm. that started to develop a lot of data analytics and, and capabilities mm -hmm. and just recently mm -hmm. released even a latest uh, neural network, graph mm -hmm. neural network mm -hmm. you can use within Neo4j. So all of mm -hmm. those things have started to evolve um, yeah. primarily, I think, from quite from requests from many users, myself included. You guys <laughs> need to go in this direction if you want me yeah. to be the, one thing that I wanted to ask you because um, I had talked to some of the folks over at TigerGraph and they were talking, uh, I guess they're talking to the folks at Neo about uh, GQL. Is that something that you think is going to take off? Is that something that you think has a lot of promise? It's not only something that's going to take off, it's something that's already, you know, well into its uh, development. Uh, mm -hmm. There is an, actually an ISO standard group that has been looking into this for the last several years. We're both right. Tiger Graph and Neo are participants mm -hmm. in that. It, it, at the last time I looked at the schedule, I think they're expecting to have it completed uh, by the end of 22, FY22. Oh, wow, uh, that's awesome. And it's going to be a combination of many things. As you know, everybody has a little different spin. Neo has their cipher language. It's a little bit different. Tiger Graph has their uh, Graph SQL or GSQL, yep. Yep. Uh, which is more similar to SQL. Yep. Um, but uh, but they're combining these things together, and I think once we get that standard, it's it's not only going to it's going to help all of the graph databases, I think, Absolutely. because now you have common languages you can use. Yeah, I, I when I started to come across uh, GQL in some documentation that I was looking at. And I saw what it was all about. I was like, finally, <laughs> because now I feel, you know, as a as somebody on the business side, if I have to make a decision on on a graph technology coming in, and you tell me there's there's one graph and it has a very specific thing, and you have to get everyone up to speed on that very specific thing, but maybe a few years from now, because graph is constantly changing, there's a better tool. Now you got to move everybody over and retrain them. But now that there is um, a conglomeration of people coming together and trying to come up with some standards makes me feel so much relief and excitement because that gives me a chance. <laughs> to do I agree. Something. I agree because one of the things I've always harped on is the fact that we need to be somewhat agnostic in the tools yeah. that we use in the sense that they should be able to communicate with each other no matter what yep. you're doing. I yep. don't want to get stuck with a, a Microsoft Word 2.0 
that goes out <laughs> of life and you can no longer open that file because they've changed their format. You want to be able yeah. to change, you be able to open whatever you're doing, no matter you know if it's now or 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, yeah. uh, having some capability of doing that. But yeah, definitely agree. It's a great time for what we're doing there. So if somebody is starting, it, it, since there's a lot of folks that are, are watching these videos that are starting to get into graph, David, where do you, where would you suggest they start their journey if they wanted to learn more about NEO or property graphs in general? Sure, uh, um, that, that was probably one of the other reasons why I really enjoyed working you know, with the NEO product is because of their community and their availability of resources. Um, it, it's, it was a good model, very, it almost it seemed like a model that was comparable to RStudio if you follow mm -hmm. them, open source, mm -hmm. very open source first, but they both developed a huge community in their areas uh, with a lot of resources, a lot of information, a lot of training. So if you go to the NEO website, you're going to find some free books to start off with. You know, mm -hmm. what is graph databases? You know, what are they all about? Uh, how to do some graph modeling, uh, how to do cipher, um, you know, things like that, that you can get get you kicking off. They have a ton, they've created a ton of uh, training sessions that are also mm -hmm. free, mm -hmm. all from intro to graph databases, all the way to data science within graph mm -hmm. databases uh, that you can utilize. But then there's a community, uh, mm -hmm. the community forum uh, that's broken up into various groups that, and they're very easy to, to ask a question and get responses. And the people that moderate that tend to keep it moving very uh, mm -hmm. free and, and, fl and flow it quickly so that you get responses. If you if you don't see a response soon, somebody will, will start looking for somebody to help you with that question. So let me ask you if there are any closing remarks or any pieces of wisdom that you would like to pass on to folks that are getting into this space or starting to find their way in this space. So any, I don't know if I have wisdom, let me see if I can find anything in there, but um, yeah, I think if you're really interested in graph databases, I think it, it, I think it's an up and coming and it's going to be around for, for many, many years and provides a new way of looking at things. Um, don't be discouraged like any other tool, it takes a while to learn and, and try to understand. Um, but it, it's something that I think can provide a lot of uh, value back to, to an organization for how they connect uh, data across multiple domains. One of the things I really liked about the, the graph databases in, in this general, and especially how you create a data model, you can change it so quickly. Unlike a mm -hmm. traditional relational data model, if you don't have your schema set up from the get-go, uh, you're gonna be really hurting if something mm -hmm. changes. With the, with the knowledge graph and graph databases, you can add things so easily and take them out and try different mm -hmm. things. It makes it so easy to connect your relationships. Mm -hmm. And then you can also connect across different domains and add to it. Mm -hmm. you, and a quick example you know, of that, I started recently with an occupation database, developed a graph around that that gives me the occupation and all the elements that make up that occupation, skills, knowledge, tasks. Mm -hmm. So I have that part of the knowledge graph. Well, then I also then got my people my inf from my information of my employees and mm -hmm. I added that information in there. So now I have employees and what work they do, their resumes, their performance, their position descriptions and evaluations. And I can start inferring different skills and then start connecting across. So if they've mm -hmm. got certain skills, those certain skills are associated with certain jobs, we can start seeing where our skills are. But then mm -hmm. I can still add other information down the road, training. You know, I can add certifications, I can add you know, any number of information very easily in finals relationships and connections, and then to start playing around a lot. So I, I guess if, if anybody, if you can hear me, I'm passionate about graph, graph network, graph databases in general. Um, I think it's something that is, uh, uh, one thing I can say, if you're really interested in looking at it, take a look at it. If you're not, uh, you're doing a disservice to yourself and to your organization. <laughs> <laughs> and and David, that's why I like talking to you. You're always so passionate and so uplifting about the space. I think that some people can get a little scared, uh, you know, approaching it, not really knowing the lingo and what's going on, um, but making sure that there are people out there like you. And if you are looking for things from David, just do a Google search. There's lots of like recordings and PowerPoints and all kinds of other things that he has done as well. And you're also on LinkedIn if people want to go and check out what you're all about. Definitely. Please feel feel free to connect and reach out if anybody has questions. I'll be more than happy to help out. All right. And that is a wrap. Again, a big thank you to David for joining me. He has so much online. Go check him out. And 
if you know anybody or if you want to see anybody on the channel for an interview or a deep dive into what they are doing, I really enjoy talking to people, hearing their stories in the knowledge graph information architecture space. So please leave it in the comments below. Give this video a thumbs up and I'll catch you next time.